I always say to young people, if they're going to write, do write about what you know about. Write about your... They will understand it. Um, the public like to feel when they're reading a book you really know what you're talking about. So uh, you're quite right. A lot of my personal life gets into books. There'll be stuff about me, about my wife, about my mother, because I touch on human beings I have touched, I have worked with. And I think that makes for a better story. When looking, I guess, also keeping yourself in uh, the public sphere, uh, you know, obviously there, there, there are successes and then there are the defeats as well. Uh, have you found that more difficult to deal with than you might have expected? Yes. Um, we all have defeats in life. You may not end up as the next Dan Rather. You know, <laughs> these things happen. Uh, but you've got to face each of those defeats, stand up and fight again. You've got to go on. What you mustn't do is give in. My rule is pretty clear. If things go wrong, sit down and cry. And 24 hours later, get up and start working again. Fantastic. And speaking of your work, I know you're here uh, giving a talk on the art of villainy, the villain as a character, which is interesting that in many cases, readers, uh, people find the villain more compelling mm, mm, than the hero. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, it's certainly easier to write because they're more multidimensional. No one's a complete villain. You get people who are, well, bad people, but you get quite good people who have a villainous streak in them, so you can play this as a game. Pure, good, decent, honest people are quite hard to write because they're boring, and the reader wants to get involved with them. And I think in, uh, in the Clifton Chronicles, the story of a thoroughly decent man, Harry Clifton, born in the back streets of Bristol, who uh, is the son of a docker and falls in love with Emma Barrington, who owns the docks, but it's her father, Hugo, who's the villain. And he's much more fun. And I, I quite worry that the two of them are so nice. Harry and Emma are so nice, and everybody's falling in love with them. But it's always Hugo they want to read about. And, always they're always, and there's the wicked Major Fisher who tries to stop his friend Giles getting the military cross. And the amount of people have said, bring back Major Fisher. So yes, you're quite right. They, they, they like villains more than they like heroes. So how do you make the hero compelling, uh, I guess, with the, the challenge of keeping it not boring? I it's a tough question. I think he's got to do things that are genuinely heroic, but at the same time, he must have a side that shows he's not a saint. None of us are saints. And he must have a side that shows he is fallible, makes mistakes, does things wrong. And in, uh, in Best Kept Secret, the third book, he makes a terrible mistake. Partly because the critics were saying they were being very flattering, but they were saying... Harry is perfect. And I thought, no, I don't want that. I mean, Harry must make mistakes. And in the third book, he makes one disastrous mistake. Now, as a storyteller and a former politician, I'd love to get your perspective on how, I guess, the two disciplines inform each other. They're the same thing, aren't they? Most, <laughs> most politicians are storytellers. But uh, the gift of storytelling itself must not be underestimated. It is a gift. You can be a good writer. Uh, you can tell, I mean, there's a great writer, he's not a uh, non-fiction, but Mr. Dalrymple is here writing about Afghanistan. He is a truly great writer, but he doesn't write novels. If you're going to write novels, you have to be a storyteller. That's a totally different art. That's a totally different skill, and it's a God-given gift. And then finally, to, to round off the discussion, uh, looking at the role of literature in society, do you think it has a, a larger role to play? Is it just about pure entertainment? How do you see that? I think it's dangerous to pontificate. I think it's dangerous to use a book to give a message because then the reader will say, no, I want entertainment, Jeffrey. I want to turn the pages. Doesn't stop the fact you can influence without even meaning to. Amazing how many young people, your age and younger, have come to me, even in this festival, and said, Cain and Abel changed my whole life. I knew what I wanted to achieve. I knew it was possible to do better by reading Cain and Abel. I never meant it to be that. I meant it to be a simple story that you couldn't not turn the page. You would want to know what happened to Cain, what happened to Abel. But it has clearly influenced thousands of young people.